there and welcome to the Business of Story. I'm Mark Howell and I have a show warning for you. If you're a big fan of Davy Crockett, who Disney made out as the king of the wild frontier, and you have a soft spot in your historical heart for the legend of the Alamo, well, you may not want to listen to this episode. But if you're interested in truth and storytelling, then this is the show for you as we correct a bit of mythology from the Wild West. Really, the theme of this show is you are what you remember. The only problem is that our memories are famously flawed and the stories we recall over time that inform our character, beliefs, outlook on life, and can even express our personalities, change considerably with every fleeting memory. Even the history we hear and the myths we buy into are often inaccurate and have significant modern-day consequences, as you'll hear today from Jason Stanford, co-author of Forget the Alamo, The Rise and Fall of an American Myth. According to Stanford, what we have all been taught about the legend of the Alamo, which fell to Mexican commander Santa Ana on March 8, 1836, 187 years ago to the day of this recording, is patently false. Right down to the fictional accounts of some of its main characters, including Sam Bowie and the beloved Davy Crockett. He surrendered late in the battle, and they executed him later that morning. That was widely accepted fact until uh, Disney's Davy Crockett show came out. And then suddenly it was politically unfeasible to tell the truth, and so they just changed all the books. Jason Stanford is a writer whose bylines have appeared in Texas Monthly, the Texas Tribune, Texas Highways, the Texas Observer, as well as many publications that have nothing whatsoever to do with Texas. Jason also publishes a Substack newsletter called The Experiment. Check it out. The former communications director for Austin Mayor Steve Adler, in 2018, he was named by Austin Monthly as the best man behind the curtain. A former political consultant, Stanford often contributed to the Austin American Statesman, Politico Magazine, Talking Points Memo, and MSNBC. From 2011 to 2015, he was a nationally syndicated columnist. During this time, he co-wrote with James Moore, Adios Mofo, Why Rick Perry Will Make America Miss George W. Bush. Stanford majored in Russian at Lewis and Clark College, which led in 1992 to him editing the Moscow Guardian, an English-language expatriate tabloid, and working as a researcher for the Los Angeles Times Bureau. Currently, he lives in Dallas, where he serves as special assistant to the superintendent of schools at Dallas Independent School District. In addition to learning why you should forget the Alamo as you currently know it, Jason will reveal some of his tried and true storytelling tips that you can use, including why you should start your stories with an ending and end with a beginning. The importance of surprising, subverting, and satisfying your audience. And the need to find the right altitude in your storytelling. So please welcome to the Business of Story, an episode that will sure to become unforgettable, Jason Stanford. Jason, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you very much. I am absolutely delighted you're here because I got a chance to read your book, Forget the Alamo, on my way out to uh, Charlotte, North Carolina last week, working with a big healthcare company out there. So you were my companion all along the way, you and your co-writers. And I got to tell you, it was one of the most fascinating and in some aspects, one of the funniest books I've read because you guys took on history to, in what I thought was a unique way. Not only were you saying, hey, here's what really happened at the Alamo, and maybe we ought to forget everything you know about the Alamo, but then in the writing, you were also kind of like, not making fun of, but but highlighting the idiosyncrasies of the human mind, the homo sapien storyteller. And one of my favorite lines is actually at the end of the book when you said, we are what we remember. 
And I thought that was really fascinating because what, you know, who we are is the stories we tell ourselves. And those stories are basically based off of history, what we've either been through or history we've consumed. And then we have a tendency of changing those memories and changing that history that then maybe more reflects accurately or not who we are today. So that's what we're going to be covering today. And that's kind of a long-winded way of saying, man, I'm so glad you're here. And I want to thank my good friend, Dr. Randy Olson, for making the connection. Well, I want to thank him too, because I'm not just a uh, a writer, but also a subscriber to this podcast. Um, it's uh, This is a, a great, great forum for discussing story. And I'm thrilled that you pointed out that one line in the book, because I think that is so central to how we remember history and who we think we are as Americans these days. Yeah, and we get it spoon-fed to us, don't we? I mean, how many of us really take the time to sit down and read history with a critical mind and, and asking ourselves, is this accurate? Or is this an agenda of a politician, a country, the writer themselves? Who knows? And for you all to take on the Alamo, which, you know, is, quote, unquote, the birthplace of Texas and the proud, proud Texans with our son Parker and his now fiance Jackie moved to Austin, Texas, a year and a half ago from SoCal. You know, he was in mm-hmm. Hollywood for all those years, and he absolutely loves Texas and everything you know that that it stands for, and I said you ought to read. Forget the Alamo, because uh, I would imagine you guys have come under a little bit of fire. Yeah, yeah, we have. My background is in politics, so I knew that writing something like this that challenged uh, the way an entire political party really saw itself, not just in Texas but nationally. In his last State of the Union, Donald Trump talked about some of the great things about America, and he mentioned the beautiful, beautiful Alamo, and Davy Crockett in particular. It's it's stunning to me that it continues to have such political currency. And so I knew when we came out with this book saying, oh, by the way, everything you think you know about this foundational myth of Texas is wrong. I knew that we were going to be attacked by by the hobbyists, you know, the people who really make the Alamo part of their identity. And I was kind of hoping that it would be part of the the campaign cycle that people running for office would feel compelled to denounce our book. And and in truth, it was. Uh, The person – there's an office in Texas called the Land Commissioner. And they're in charge of all the state-owned lands and and much of our oil holdings. They collect oil royalties. But they also have oversight over the Alamo, which is a state facility. And Dawn Buckingham, who was a state senator at the time, she was campaigning for this office – and in her stump speech, everywhere she went, she denounced that book, and that was us. I wish she would have name-checked us, by, but that was fine because the lieutenant governor of Texas felt compelled to cancel our event at the State History Museum. Now, me, maybe a book about state history should be discussed at the State History Museum. I'm not an elected official in Texas. That's fine. But when he, he – we were, I think, two to three weeks out from our public pub date. It was selling fine. We weren't in danger of setting the world on fire. And, you know, we were ranked in the 500s on Amazon. And then Dan Patrick canceled our – not only forced the State History Museum to cancel our event, but then claimed credit for it the next day. The next week, we sold out Amazon, and we were uh, in the top 20 on Amazon sales rankings. So – it is silly and it is offensive to be censored by politicians, but God, it's good for business. Dan Patrick is what? The governor? The lieutenant governor Patrick. of Texas, who apparently had nothing better to do. So the museum has scheduled you all. Come in, mm-hmm. you're gonna help, you know, launch, forget the Alamo. And you're going to say it's revisionist history, which is also kind of a, a negative way of talking about people that come in and say, here's what actually happened, isn't it? I mean, when someone calls you a revisionist, doesn't it have sort of a negative connotation to it? Oh, absolutely, 100%. But actually, the history of the Alamo that we were taught in schools in Texas and that everyone thinks they know from the movies and TV, that is revisionist history. Because the first thing they did after the fall of the Alamo, they being Sam Houston, who is the leader of the, of the Texas rebels who are trying to secede from Mexico, he knew he had to rewrite the story. 
And so you talk about we are what we remember. He right then had to inf- – it was the first time the myth of the Alamo was enforced by political leaders. And he said, no, no, no. This is what happens. And his – you know, he had this writer who later wrote a book about the Alamo from his, you know, the way he wanted to do it. They completely rewrote the testimony of eyewitnesses including William Travis's slave, Joe – for their own own uses, both the Mexicans and the Texans did. But yeah, it has always from jump been rewritten. It has always been revised, revisionist history. We're just trying to set it right about what actually happened. And more importantly, to your point about we are what we remember, how since the battle for the last 187 years, we've been rewriting and enforcing the revisionist history as part of Texas, which to me is much more important, how the story has been enforced rather than what actually happened. All right. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to give us the cliff notes to what actually happened. But before we do that, why this book? Why did you take it on with your co-writers? What was it about it that you said, man, we got to dedicate a few years of our lives to dig through all this stuff and let the world know what really happened? Well, uh, this, this will amuse any one of your listeners who's ever written a book. We thought it would be fun. Um, <laughs> we were wrong. <laughs> Writing a book with your friends is a little like saying, hey, let's get married for two years. And Brian Burrow did it because he thought it would be fun to, to write a book with his friends. And, and uh, we were out having brunch. Chris was talking about a, a column he was writing about how silly it was to spend half a billion dollars to fix up the Alamo because it's based on this r- white supremacist myth is what he called it. And Brian, who was raised in Texas, said, what? You know, he'd never heard any of this. And Brian, Chris goes off about, oh, yeah, that line, the, you know, this wasn't true and that wasn't true and this is, this is why it all happened. We'll get to that in a second. And Brian said, well, God, that would be a good book. And when Brian says that would be a good book, it means something different than when a regular person says it, right? We're all, we all have that experience of we're telling a story and someone says, oh, you should write a book about that. And what they mean probably is, oh, that's a cool story and maybe you, could fit, you can find 90,000 words in that. And no one ever re- even thinks about 90,000 words. When Brian thinks about, oh, that would be a good book, he under- you know, he's, at that point he'd written six books and three of them were New York Times bestsellers. Two of them had been made into movies with stars that you and I have heard of. And, and he, he sees it a good book two ways, three ways. One, it would actually be a good book. Two, you could sell it to a – someone would pay you to do it, right? You could get a decent six-figure advance from a major publishing house to do it. Otherwise, why do it? And three, someone might actually buy it. You know, He's written a lot of books. He's made a lot of money on books no one's ever heard of. Right. Well, and how about number four? They might actually make a movie out of it. That's that's just silly talk. No one no one seriously thinks about that unless your unless your first two initials are JK. <laughs> okay. All right. So he's thinking in this like Babe Ruth Galaxy business mind when it comes to writing books, and weirdly, we all just let it go. Like, oh, okay, let's get back to our eggs. But Brian's still running the subroutine in his head. He's still cogitating on it. And we're talking about something else. And then he says, oh, and you should call it Forget the Alamo, at which point our shoulders slumped and we all fell into a deep, dark depression because we realized we had just ruined the next two years of our lives. And here you go. Yep. The story gets worse from there. He put together a seven-paragraph email to his agent, and he was already under contract to write a different book. He said, I know you want me to write this book that you've paid me a lot of money to do, but I have this idea. I want to do this book with two guys you've never heard of. Two days later, we had a book deal. It was the craziest process I'd ever heard of. And away you went. So it sounds like you went along on the journey of the reader as you were writing this, because you're like, what? White supremacy? I know Phil Collins, the famous yep. uh, British rock star, comes to play in this, as does Ozzy Osbourne, as does as you guys roll out the whole story. You don't just stop with the fall of the Alamo 187 years ago. You take it right up to modern day and how we are still living this myth of what happened when you were talking about what actually happened. But you must have been fascinated to learn yourself as you were writing this. And you, I think you had in your book, too, you talked about an amazing historian researcher 
that was a very big part of your team that would sit down and she would dig through all of these materials and show them to you? Yeah, Dr. Maggie Walsh, she was she was indispensable for us because none of I mean, we Brian and Chris are trained journalists. They understand how to do all that. I've, I've done opposition research in politics where I'm used to digging up public records. But having someone with an academic mind was in, was invaluable. I mean, for me, this was I was a, almost a blank slate. I moved to Texas when I was 23, never took Texas history in class, obviously. And my big association with the Alamo was Pee Wee Herman. And so I would always ask people whether or not there was a basement, you know. All right. For our listeners who, that, who don't follow Pee Wee Herman, what's, what's the connection with Pee Wee Herman? There is a 1980s movie starring Paul Rubens in his character as Pee Wee Herman. And he, uh, his bicycle got stolen, and he was told that they had hidden it in the uh, basement of the Alamo. And so he goes on this journey, this quest to find his bicycle in the basement of the Alamo, only to find out that there is no basement of the Alamo. Actually, there is, but not in the Alamo. The, what we think of as the Alamo, which is the chapel, there's a different building that has a basement in the Alamo. All right. We digress, but I, had, I have forgotten that movie. So – you were learning all of this as you were writing it. Oh, yeah. What was your big aha moment in this? Like when you're like, wow, we really got something here. We thought we were writing a different book when we set out. We thought we were writing a book about how all the things you were taught weren't true. From little things like the line and, you know, uh, Colonel Travis draws a line in the sand and anyone who wants to stay and defend in this hopeless cause cross the line. Otherwise, you're free to go. That never happened. It wasn't true that they knowingly died or that they knowingly gave their lives. They tried to surrender twice, including the night before the siege. Uh, They didn't buy Sam Houston any time, which is a a rationale that people often use today when they teach it. Santa Ana, the Mexican army was still catching up by the time the siege was over. And Sam Houston, only the real value of it was that Sam Houston used this saying, see, he's going to kill all of you, join my army, that he used it as a recruitment tool. And it worked really well. And not everyone died. It's just all the white dudes died. There were several uh, Tejanas and there was a a white lady, Claire Driscoll, who's very famous. And of course, Joe's slave uh, survived. Travis's slave, Joe. So there are all these little things. And we thought we were writing a little debunking book. And we talk about how it's been used in popular culture and everything. I'm sorry. And the biggest one that we were going to – we thought the book was going to be about how they were actually s- seceded. They weren't fighting for freedom against an evil tyrant, Santa Ana, which is what everyone thinks. Santa Ana was trying to enforce the Mexican constitution's abolition, their ban on slavery. They would made an exception for Texas because they wanted Anglos to settle in Texas to provide a bulwark against the Comanches, which were regularly raiding. And they couldn't settle Texas because Mexicans knew that they would just get killed by the Indians. So they invited Anglos to come and settle there. And all the, reason, the only reason Anglos wanted to settle in Texas was to grow cotton. And to grow cotton at the time, they needed to enslave their workforce. And so they made an exception, and that was very – Mexico struggled with that. They kept wrestling back and forth with that in, in Mexico City. And it was ultimately – they said, OK, no, we need to stop making exceptions for Texas. We need to abolish slavery, and they need to start paying taxes like everyone else. Well, to the Texas settlers, that was tyranny, and that's the way the story's told here. In Mexico, it just looked like a big land grab by the United States, which whether or not that was – the, the foreign policy of the United States government at the time, that is effectively what happened. And we were thought we were writing that book, just debunking everything you know about the Alamo is wrong. And then we had coffee. Brian and I had coffee with a historian named Dr. Andres Tijerina. And his first name is very important, Andres. And he told us about, you know, the study of it all and the academics and how basically – Hispanic historians could give a rat's crap about the Alamo because really it's white people's history, right? The way it's told is to enforce the heroic Anglo narrative, which is what we call it in the book. But then he told us about his experience as a boy when he was a child of migrant workers and he was somewhere in West Texas at the time, Odessa or someplace like that, not notably friendly at the time to Hispanics. 
and they were taking, he was a little boy and he was taking Texas history. And the teacher made him stand up. She pointed at him and she said, Andy, it could have been, because she couldn't say his name, Andres. She, Andy, it could have been Andy's grandfather who killed Davy Crockett. And instantly he felt like the villain. And that, and then we started asking other Hispanics in Texas if they had similar experiences. And either they felt like that in school, in class. They, one, Andres' wife said she the same thing happened to her. She felt like crawling under the desk. And it's like they're all – Hispanics in Texas are taught that they're the ones who killed Christ because they, they killed Davy Crockett. Another thing happens is the field trip. The Alamo is the most popular field trip destination in Texas. People come from out of, out of San Antonio. They make the long trek to, to San Antonio on the school buses to go through the Alamo. And often, like, Texas does a really good job of raising up these little Texans and they put them through the Alamo and they come out Mexicans and Americans. And it gets to a point where I had a friend who grew up in San Antonio and he said they used to play Alamo in the alley after school. And it was all the white kids on one side and all the brown kids on the other, right? Except in Texas, they call them Mexicans. Even no matter where they're from, even if they're born and raised in Texas, you call them Mexicans, which is now I figured out why. Except when he would play the Alamo, the white guys would win. And there is a misconception in Texas now. Like there, a majority of Hispanics in Texas cannot correctly identify who won the Battle of the Alamo because it is told as this heroic tale. And why wouldn't why wouldn't the Texans win? And it's it's, it's remarkably confusing to people when you make them confront the facts. So this story, this this myth, is basically a way to separate good guys from bad guys in Texas. And that's when it really clicked on for us. And you make, you have an analogy in there. If someone, you invite someone over to stay at your home for a week and they're visiting and then they just kind of take over yep. and they start really having parties or inviting all kinds of people over. And you're like, Hey, this is my home. You know, here are the house rules and whatever. And they kind of give you the finger and an F you. And they said, no, this is our house now. And at some point, you're going to have to kick them out. But in this case, uh, they they stayed and they stayed, and Santa Ana showed up saying, look it, I've done everything I can for you to help you make this territory work, but you can't have slavery, and you got to get out. Yep. And they just weren't having any part of it. But you, you said they did attempt to surrender a couple times, but Santa Ana at the end said, no, it's you, yep. you've, you have literally drawn your line in the sand. You've distanced to this point so much that we are going to take you out whether you like it or not. Legally, what they did was piracy. And you kill pirates. You don't put them in prison. You don't pardon them. You, you know, it's, he, was, he was going to put them all to death to make examples of them, as he had done in other uh, rebelling Mexican states. Now, the other rebelling Mexican states at the time weren't fighting for independence and they weren't fighting over slavery. They were fighting over the form of government, right? So there was already an ongoing rebellion against Santa Ana. It was the, the, the Anglo-Texas settlers who co-opted that rebellion for a secessionist movement. So yeah, they, they, wanted, to, they wanted to surrender and get away with it. He, he was like, fine, surrender, I'll kill you or you can fight. <laughs> or you can fight. And, and do I have this right that uh, William Travis, Sam Bowie, and some of those folks were not only slave owners, but also slave traders in some respects, and that they had bolted out of Louisiana and left like, like hoodwinked people and big land grab speculation? I mean, took a bunch of people's money running from the law, and Texas was the place for them to find safe haven? Yeah, there were a lot of people, uh, settlers in Texas who were escaping judgment of, you know, court and judicial judgment and financial judgment uh, in, in the United States. Jim Bowie, notably, uh, big swindler there. But he, uh, you know, one thing he was doing in Texas to make money was taking shipments of pi pirated slaves, pirated shipments of slaves. You know, pirates would take over a slave ship. They'd land in Texas. Jim Bowie would get, would buy them and he would take them across the border into Louisiana. So he'd buy them at a discount, take them into and claim the reward. 
and and then be, he would because he had turned them in, he would get be able to buy them back at half off, and then he would pull them back in at the and he was doing this at a time when it was illegal to import slaves into Texas because that's one of the things they tried to do. They tried to close the border to Louisiana. Um, so yeah, border we've we've had border problems ever since before there was ever a Texas. Let alone the mor- the morality of owning an individual and putting them to work and then getting them from pirates that stole them and then yes. buying them back for how I mean it's, it's yeah. crazy and of course Jim Bowie's known for the the Bowie knife absolutely yeah he uh, yeah he achieved national fame it was a, one of the weirdest things about the Alamo is that two national celebrities died there Jim Bowie was famous if you don't know for he was the second in a duel. You know, the second is supposed to keep the peace and the duel was over and someone said something mean to Jim Bowie afterwards and Jim Bowie gutted him with his knife and the knife became very famous. And this is pre-Alamo. Pre-Alamo. This is pre-Alamo and that's what put him on the map. Right. And Davy Crockett, of course, was a, a, a famous uh, outdoorsman and a, a congressman who had a gift of a turn of a phrase and and then was – Weirdly fictionalized after his political career that made him a big, big star. And, uh, and he was looking to restart his political career in Texas. Well, he was kind of a failed politician, though, wasn't he? I mean, he was in Washington, D.C., trying to do all this stuff. Wasn't that terrific of a politician, but he was a great bullshitter. And he would tell these great stories of, of the wild, wild west and killing bar and, and he had his old you know, gun. Was it Betsy, he called it? Uh, old Betsy, and, yeah. Old Bessie, and isn't that really where – in 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 your book, I think you mentioned – I had never thought about this before. The likes of Davy Crockett and Jim Bowie became some of the first American celebrities. They became the first influencers yep. you know, <laughs> back in the day purely because they had a good story and they were good bullshitters. And mm-hmm. uh, Jim Bowie, in the case, was an absolute swindler from the get-go. He knew yep. how to manipulate people. Yep. You know, and then you hear that Jim Bowie had this big fight, and he was fighting to the death at the Alamo. But again, according to your research, he was actually really, really sick in bed. He didn't oh, yeah. even get out of bed. Yeah, he may have not lived to the battle. He may have died before the battle. No one really knows. Yeah, and Davy Crockett, as Disney would show, you know, comes out shooting old Betsy and taking out the Mexicans right and left. And then when he runs out of bullets, he starts hammering them over the head with, with old Betsy. But that didn't actually happen either, right? Didn't he surrender? He, he surrendered late in the battle, and they executed him later that morning. And uh, that was widely accepted fact until uh, Disney's Davy Crockett show came out. And then suddenly it was mm-hmm. politically unfeasible to tell the truth, and so they just changed all the books. When did you publish Forget the Alamo? June 2021. June of 2021. So we're going on coming out you know, almost two years now. Have you been still getting lots of blowback from politicians and Texans and folks about this book? Uh, the blowback has mostly stopped. Uh, what is surprising to me is how people keep talking about it, though. It's really unusual to be talking about a book even a month after its release. And here we're coming up on two years and we're talking about it now. This, this shows not – it. Does, I'm not bragging about the book so much as talking about how important it, Texas is to Texans. And they just love this story. Also, this book is a great thing to give to, to your dad at Christmas. So it's, I think it's going to be a perennial. <laughs> All right. So let's fast forward to today. The state of Texas, and correct me if I'm wrong, I don't want to be a revisionist here, they've <laughs> earmarked like $450 million to build this museum down at the Alamo, and it is based on Phil Collins' Alamo collection of artifacts, which then historians and collectors and antiquities dealers have gone in and said maybe 90% of it, up to 90% of it could be fake. He didn't even know it. He was just buying garb that he thought was the Alamo, and he even had to tell himself his own stories about, no, this actually happened, or this was actually there. But they're now like, "Mm, mm, the vast majority of this is probably fake. (laughs) Well, okay, so let's back up a little bit. The Alamo, as, as it exists in the culture here, 
isn't notably known to be true. So like people have are even the, the historians who are invested in this know that that the truth is malleable in, in this in the telling of this. And it wasn't just the American American boomers who uh, that like Pretty much any guy with white hair in America probably grew up at a certain point with, in love with Davy Crockett. That looked at him as the as the image of, of masculinity. Apparently, kids in London watched it too. And he used to play Alamo in his backyard. His grandma cut up her like I think it was a rabbit coat to make him a little coonskin cap, and you know he just loved it. And so it imprinted on him very young. And one time when he was on tour in America, he stopped over at the Alamo wandered over to a gift shop and was was entranced with all the historical artifacts. I think the first thing he got was a letter or some document signed by Sam Houston. And suddenly, you know, it's like one of those things. You come home from a business trip w- with, with an elephant and suddenly everyone's getting you elephants for the rest of your life because they think you like elephants. Everyone gave him Alamo <laughs> Happens stuff. to me all the time. You should see the pachyderms I got out back. <laughs> yeah, so – yeah, and he became an avid collector, and and he wasn't really all that concerned. He was more enthusiastic. He wasn't super concerned with authenticity. He didn't challenge the people. And so you got a multimillionaire who just wants to buy a whole bunch of stuff. God, the guy who owned the gift shop across the street sold him the damn gift shop. You know, and he starts digging in the dirt and finding horseshoes and saying, "Oh, these were for Santa Anna's army." Well, no, they weren't, and. So people are just selling him stuff and three guys in particular are working together to just send him and they – like this knife that had been in the collector's uh, arena for a long time. Suddenly this guy magically rubs some oil on it and Jim Bowie's initials appear. Can you believe it? Oh my god. No one had ever noticed that before. And yeah, like so he had at one time – the world's biggest collection of Alamo memorabilia. And it was all in his basement in museum quality cabinets in, in Switzerland. And he needed to move. He needed to get out of the house. And so his wife said, yeah, that, that's got to go. So he put out the word, said, OK, I will give it to a museum in Texas. But there's one condition. They have to d- display all of the stuff all the time. You can't just – not a little bit. And no museum would work that way. They're like, yeah, no, we're not doing that. And so he's out one day eating tacos with someone from the land office. And the land office, again, is the state agency with jurisdiction over the Alamo. And isn't it run by a Bush, Jeb Bush's son, the land office? Uh, It was up until this year. Don Buckingham took over from him. Yeah. And Phil Collins is talking about, oh, yeah, we'd love to find someone to take it. And she says, oh, we'll take it. Now, state didn't – no one had authorized her to say, oh, yeah, make a half a million dollar commitment over over tacos. That's a great idea. You know, No one had given her – no one knew she was even doing this. She just got caught along for the ride. Some guy said, hey, you want to have lunch with Phil Collins? It's ironic too. They did it over tacos. There you go. And so you – know, which in Texas is a binding contract. And, <laughs> and he says, OK, cool. And so they make a deal and the deal was in – by 2023, you have to have a museum open. And so that's what set off the last part of the book is everyone said, oh, crap, we got to do something with this, which meant the city and the state. The city owns the road in front of the chapel, which is actually the middle of the Alamo. That's where all the fighting took place. And there were some tourist traps who owned – the, the one side of the Alamo Fort, which is where Jim Bowie died, and the state owns the Alamo with the Taco Bell roof, the, which is the, just the chapel. So all of those groups had to work to agree on what would actually be told at the Alamo in this museum. And that's, what, that's where a lot of the conflict in the back half of the book comes from. In the course of researching all that conflict and how, what, what story would they tell at the Alamo and who would get to tell it, started hearing a lot of whispers that Phil Collins' collection really wasn't all it's cracked up to be. Everyone loved him. Apparently, he was on a first-name basis with you know the groundskeepers at the Alamo. Sweetheart of a guy. No one wanted to say that he had been swindled. But we started talking to people. And in the collectibles, collectible community, it was pretty widely known that 
all the most famous stuff he had wasn't on the up and up and and that the people who had been selling him the stuff weren't the most highly regarded. So we just – and then we got to interview them and they said, oh, no, you know, sometimes you just got to follow your gut on these things to authenticate things. And uh, we put it in the book. It uh, it made a little news. Phil Collins pretty much shrugged, didn't really care. You know, he was – he just likes the story, man. The people we wrote about sued us for defamation and they couldn't cite one example in the lawsuit of us defaming them. And eventually a judge threw it out uh, with judgment saying, no, no, there's nothing to this. So – yeah, it was it was pretty funny, and now yeah, now they've built a museum with all the fake stuff. That's wild. And the the one other well, there's several anecdotes in there that I just loved. But the the George W. Bush rallying the was it the 1990 no two which which year was the Ryder Cup and oh my God, the you, Americans' ass was given was being handed to him, and George W. Bush shows up to give them a rallying cry, and he reads the Travis letter. And says, remember the Alamo, basically. And they're like all looking around like, what the hell? And then they go out and they win. A very unexpected win. The Americans were getting their butts kicked, right? They were just devastated. They were so far behind. And Ben Crenshaw was the captain. And he's buddies with with George W. Bush. Ben Crenshaw is from Austin. And so Bush comes in and gives him this pep talk. And he's governor at the time. So it must have been in the 1990s. It was the 1999 I just looked it up right now. The 1999 Ryder Cup. All right. And so they're all in this hotel together and they're depressed and they're they're eating pizza or something like that. And Bush comes in and reads them the famous William B. Travis letter of, you know, to all Texans and, and Americans everywhere. It has that famous phrase, victory or death. And by God, the Americans start to believe in themselves and they make the biggest comeback in Ryder Cup history the next day. And they're also stoked about it, which is a perfect encapsulation of how this myth has been used to to rev up uh, conservatives ever since. There was, the funniest thing was, though, one time he was at uh, the – as governor, he was at the Baseball Hall of Fame. And it was right after – and it was, it was when Nolan Ryan was getting inducted. And someone asked him what he feel felt about the time – Robin Ventura, who is now the manager of the White Sox, but then he was a famous uh, – he was a great hitter. And he got either hit or brushed back by a Nolan Ryan fastball. And if your listeners don't know, a Nolan Ryan fastball is a scary thing to behold. He was – if he, he threw fast when it wasn't common to throw fast. And he's a big dude, right? He, he lifted weights before it was popular to lift weights. Now everyone looks like Nolan Ryan. But back then he was this superimposing rare guy. Scary, and he he had no problem throwing the baseball at someone's head just to move him, you know, to make it harder to hit the ball. Robin Ventura lost his his uh, his temper, rushed up the, to the mound, and starts a fight with Nolan Ryan, who promptly puts him in a headlock and starts punching him in the face over and over again. It is a one of the most famous images in Texas. I have a a poster of it on my wall, and uh, it's. It's something that makes Texans super proud is the memory of Nolan Ryan beating the ever-living snot out of Robin Ventura. And so someone comes up to – a journalist comes up to George W. Bush, the governor of the state of Texas, the Republican nominee for president, and asks him what he thinks about Nolan Ryan beating the crap out of Robin Ventura. (laughs) And George W. Bush says three words and walk away. He says, remember the Alamo. Somehow, somehow that makes sense to Texans, and you don't need to explain it to them why. That is beautiful. So politicians forever have played off of the – I mean, the first – Sam Houston, for crying out loud, knew what a debacle the Alamo was. So he completely rewrites, reframes the story. Remember, we we are what we remember to rally his troops to finally beat Santa Ana at is it San Jacinto, the big war, the big fight, their battle there, which was a couple weeks after the Alamo, and that began kind of changing, you know, turning the tide. So the Alamo and that that battle at San Jacinto is really the beginning of the end of Mexico owning Texas and America ultimately taking it over. So politicians have been using the remember the Alamo forever. You had mentioned at the top of the show about Trump coming in, you know, and saying what a beautiful thing, even though all you picture is the massacre of, you know, the, the defenders of the Alamo. 
And Randy and Olson and I were talking about this. He and I did a show right after Trump got elected. It was show number 66 here, so many years ago now, just talking about actually what a great storyteller Trump was in that he was able to use essentially the end, but therefore America used to be great, but America is no longer great. Therefore, I'm going to make America great again. And he ran, you know, the, the lunatic got elected on that. And I know when Randy has presented this concept to people, they say, no, he's, he's, he's a communicator that communicates at a third grade level, a lot of people, journalists will say. But he's incredibly, obviously, or at least was very effective with this. And I know Randy has been trying to get the ABT, and they wrote a whole book on it, The Narrative Gem for Politics, with Great your book. good friend. Great book. Yeah, it it really – and in fact, you know, right when it came out about two weeks later, I saw Hillary Clinton on NPR. Well, it wasn't, I didn't see her on NPR. I saw her on substation, and she was on NPR, and they she had a quote, and it was a perfect and but therefore. And I thought, oh, my God, did someone actually get to Hillary Clinton and teach her how to do this? <laughs> What I want to come back to is this concept, and I, Randy is so frustrated by trying to get politicians to take up the whole and but therefore. And you've got some thoughts on why they'll never do it unless it comes from you know, a CEO or the business world. Can you share that with us? Sure. Um, and, and this is easier for some politicians to get than others. And Hillary's husband, Bill, is remarkably good at it because instead of once upon a time, he comes from the Southern School, which is y'all ain't going to believe this, you know, and that's if you're telling someone that they're going to be surprised, that's pretty good. Like, oh, OK, cool. All right. What do I got to know? The classic people get p- politics weeds out people who aren't really good at school. All right. Get a lot of lawyers in Congress and that's no fault of theirs. Lot, there's some doctors. There's successful people. There aren't a lot of people who communicate at a third grade level, right? They're taught to communicate in a different way. We all get our gold stars in politics and government because we're good at school. And in school, you got to learn a lot of information and synthesize it and regurgitate it, right? It's you, you're not you don't get an A for telling a good story. You get an A for remembering all the facts and being able to explain it. Not necessarily in an interesting way at all. And it breeds Thousands of very, very smart and well-meaning people who believe that if you just sit still long enough and pay attention, I'll explain to you why I'm right. And I'll leave it unsaid, but you'll understand that I'm also telling you why you're wrong. And weirdly, this doesn't work, right? And so you'll turn on C-SPAN any day and what you have is a lot – or city council meetings are the worst, right? Because the the bureaucrat will come with a briefing on something really important about, say – food deserts or health disparities where poor people are dying at a faster rate than than wealthy people or why there are one neighborhood that's white and wealthy and another neighborhood that's brown and black and, and poor. Like these are really gripping and, and tense topics and the presentation will be so boring, offensively boring that it is an act of will to continue to listen past the first minute. And it's because we say we just pile facts on top of each other and keep saying this is the information you need to know. And no one ever – and people think it's beneath them. People think it is dumbing things down to make it interesting in any way or to put the facts in a story so that you are emotionally involved in it. Like Star Trek to me is the most frustrating thing ever. I love it. I'm going to go on record right now in case my wife ever sees this or listens to this. I love Star Trek. We're good, babe. Okay? But, but. Star, Star Trek is based on this supposition that if people were just rational, they'd make better decisions. Captain Kirk, wildly emotional, flies off the handle, needs to be controlled by his half Vulcan better half, Spock, who, thank God he's Vulcan. He can make logical decisions. Well, brains don't work that way. They make emotional decisions and use logic to rationalize them, right? There's that famous experiment of the dude who had some spike through his brain and it wiped out his ability to feel emotions. And so you think he can make perfect decisions. But no, from the rest of it, up until that time, he'd been making pretty good decisions up and other than dodging metal spikes. But after that, he made horrible decisions in his life. Like we, we teach 
politicians that the most honest way to communicate is devoid of anything that actually makes us human and and yields better decisions. We think that's manipulative, and it can, of course, be manipulative, but it's not dishonest to include emotions in your story because that's who we are as humans. We can't say that in this, the essential part of being human is dishonest. Do you know Jonathan Haidt, uh, one of America's foremost social psychologists? Yep. You um, wrote The Happiness Hypothesis mm. in a, a book or two after that. I just loved it, and I think – Maybe even it was in the happiness hypothesis he talks about that guy with the rod that goes through his head. He lives. He survives. And like you said, it just somehow turned off that emotional side of his brain. And I think maybe even at one point he thought his wife was a hat or something like that. I don't remember the whole story. But Jonathan Haidt says. Can't rule that out, though. Can't rule it out. (laughs) (laughs) And, And Haidt says, and I just love this line. He says, our brains are story processors. Not logic processors. Yeah. And yet everything you're talking about, these people lead with logic when the brain really just wants that emotional pull of a good story. And then, of course, you can back it up with logic, right? I mean, Absolutely. so I tell you a story, you get completely bought into it, and you're like, God, yeah, I feel it. I can see it. And then you're, you're questioning, okay, can you prove that to me? Well, yeah, let me show you the ROI. Let me show you the logic. Let me show you the numbers that now prove out what I just shared with you in this emotional story. Well, and that's what the power, the, the, the scary power of storytelling is, right? People don't ask you to prove it. They want you to just give them if – you've, if you've caught them up in the story, all they want is things to satisfy that story. So Make America Great Again is a three-act play in four words, right? If, you, if you're bought in then – You're not asking for someone to prove it. You just want more. Give me more of that, Mm -hmm. right? And so Mm -hmm. this is another thing where liberals – I'm using the term classically, not politically. The liberal mindset is please sit still while I explain things to you. But we're constantly litigating things. We think we have to prove the thing that you already agree with. And so the listener is kind of put back like why are you just lecturing to me? Just I'm with you. Just let's go. Right. And so that's why whenever an inspiring politician who comes along and I'm using inspiring very loosely, I'll define it this way. A politician who when they talk, I feel better. Right. They don't aren't trying to make me feel better, but I feel calmer. Like, oh, they're good at talking. I can relax because most politicians aren't good at it. My God, can you give me an example of one of those? Because I can't think of one. Pete Buttigieg is extraordinarily good at talking. He can explain things. And I go, oh, okay. He understands what's going on in the world. Like, not that necessarily I agree with him. I I do, but he can take he can take a challenging question and calmly answer it, and not doing it in a let me lecture you way. But he can explain the world, right? Bill Clinton, extraordinarily good at explaining the world. So much so that Obama said he should be his uh, explainer in chief. And is it because they're using story? Yeah, because they get the basic principles of storytelling. And, and it engages the brain in that way. You mentioned that line at the beginning of this podcast of we are what we remember. And you talked about memory and how we're constantly changing it because our memory isn't so much a hard drive as it is a blank slate, right? We're constantly writing it and we're rewriting it without even realizing that we're changing our own memories and they're being affected by emotions we feel. I mean, my memory of this podcast will change if you and I meet someday and have a drink, right? Because that will rewrite the memory of this event. And we fundamentally are taught the wrong thing about communicating with people when we think it's just an exchange of information, when really we're trying to engage someone else's brain on their level. You had mentioned, I think, to Randy at some point, Randy was recalling your your conversation with him to me. It was, he was saying, hey, man, yeah, get this guy on your show. And I was absolutely delighted that he has made this connection. But you had talked about, too, when he was sort of expressing his concern about politicians and that they just don't get this. And you had pointed to because they don't follow CEOs or it takes a, a very well-spoken storytelling CEO to make this point for you. Can you elaborate on that for me a little bit? Sure. I think CEOs are know they have to sell things. Either they have to sell it to their board, they have to sell it to their investors, or they have to sell it to customers or the, to, to their workforce. 
they have a lot, especially nowadays when Larry Fink is talking about stakeholder capitalism as opposed to just worrying about your share price. We have a lot of people who are involved in the story now and they're having to really communicate with the way things are, which is why we have things like DEI. We have you know diversity initiatives and we've got ESG, environmental sustainability and governance in corporate America because – they don't just get to talk about these issues, right? They actually have a whole bunch of stuff to recycle. They have a lot of workers who really care about this stuff, and they're not just going to be able to give a speech on it and ask someone to vote for them in November, right? This isn't just going to be the subject of a television commercial. It's the daily lives of everyone who works there and the communities in which they work and in people who use their product. We in politics who aren't involved in business often mistake these actions for just greenwashing or doing things for appearance. Uh, and sometimes they are. But but they really but Ford is reinventing itself right now. That was a client I had when I was in PR and they are changing what the idea of a car is. Right? That it's not freedom anymore. Now it's this device you buy, like a phone. And you can update the software when you park it in your garage at night and get in and it can be the software of the car can be completely different and your experience of the car can be completely different. So as they're changing all of that and what the idea of a factory means anymore or what it means to work for Ford, is it at Ford? Or you know, this is the company that built the, – that invented the assembly line and how we put things in, which is a story. And now they're completely changing the idea of a different – the same facet of American life in a different century. And – that's lived experience, and they don't get the luxury of talking about things in the abstract or just telling people in a one-way communication because now we live in an era where stakeholders can talk back to you. So it's this conversation. So they don't have the luxury of even just telling a story because they have to act it out. They're living this story, and they have to explain it to so many different audiences. And so often in politics and in the public – in the media, we tell the story as if it is – an abstract or a representation of something, a hypothetical. And too often journalists don't understand the way business works or the way campaigns actually work and they only judge the appearance of things and not the substance of things. And so we get very superficial news coverage about business and, and which business is all of our commerce or a lot of our daily lives, our lives as consumers. And you get a lot of politicians talking about our lives in ways where the, it sounds like they just don't get it because they fundamentally don't. So bringing this full circle, and then I'm going to want to hit on three main points that you sent me, that just for all of our storytellers out there, as how they can be better at this. Everything you just covered, I'm going to picture now Samuel Houston as the CEO of Texas. He has a horrific story to tell about the Alamo that he has to reframe in order to recruit and rally his troops to go and beat that uh, you know Santa Ana so that they can ultimately make the state civilized and in a very American industrial way. So he uses story in order to do that. Changes history, and of course that story is told over and over and over again under the singular narrative of remember the Alamo, and it gets absolutely embedded in the American psyche, and as you call it, the heroic Anglo narrative when it was really anything, everything but that, right? So we were seeing this way back when. I mean, you know, we even think back 187 years ago, well, they weren't nearly as sophisticated as we are today in our communication, yet they are. They're homo sapiens. It's how we have evolved as a species, right? So you can see it in action, and I would call him a politician because he's the one that made, you know, really got that whole ball rolling. So, in your line of work and all the work you've done in politics and now you're working with the school district there in, in Dallas and so forth, you sent me three things to think about as a storyteller. Number one, I'd love to have you just give us a minute or so on each one of these. What does this mean? Start with an ending and end with a beginning. Every start of everything should be leaving behind something, right? It's If you're going to start something, then something else has – I may, it might just be the status quo. The way things were has to end with the beginning. So you have to be mindful not just of the step you took but where you're leaving. Like what are you leaving behind? And what is, what is getting 
if you're building something, what do you have to what do you have to destroy, or what are you building it on top of? And then at the end, the most the best ending ever is they lived happily ever after, right? You have to it's you have to imagine that you've finally gotten to that point where they can continue where they can go on and do the next thing. Because the, th- the story has to be necessarily what must happen in order for the future to happen. You don't need to write about the yeah. future, but what has to happen to get there? So the idea, and let's put it into an ABT form because, you know, I, I kind of nerd out on this stuff. Um, this is a way we've always been doing it, and it's been really successful. But this is the change that is afoot right now. Therefore, we need to consider doing it this way so that we can live into what this brighter future looks like tomorrow. Right. And the the, the, the horrible responsibility of the therefore is you have to make people imagine it before they can do it. Right, the the character. Someone has to create the vision. You don't accidentally end up in the right place, or uh, you can, but that's a horrible story, and that's a lousy way to lead. I am writing that down right now. The horrible responsibility of the therefore is to make sure that your audience can picture what a brighter tomorrow looks like. Yeah. Right? Yep. So you want to really light up that theater of the mind, right? So they can picture it, they can feel it, they can emotionally buy into it. Right, absolutely. And too often, uh, you know, going back to politics, we we tell don't show and we tell about the most boring thing imaginable. We say, you know, you know, some politicians are real good about telling you how you're going to feel in that truck, and some politicians are real good about telling you about why the carburetor is better. Yeah. It's not about what you make, but what you make happen. Yep. That is the important part of the story. All right, number 2. You gave me three words: surprise, subvert, and satisfy the the surprise y'all ain't going to believe this right the first paragraph of forget the alamo is here's all the things we think and they're all wrong right and then you need to subvert their their expectations right they're expecting this book about the alamo and oh it's funny oh it's oh wait it's about race i didn't okay yeah i knew it was about slavery but i didn't know it's about now right you need to they have to – you can't just – just you have to satisfy their expectations, but you also need to leverage their expectations to surprise them to keep them reading. It can't – otherwise, it's just a and, 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 and they go, okay, yeah, I expected this. But unless you're subverting those expectations, they're not going to be – they're not – they're not – you're not going to catch them off guard. It's hard mm-hmm. to make people laugh unless you are subverting their expectations. Humor is all based on this, right? Uh, if you don't – because you laugh partly because of surprise often that you weren't expecting that twist where they took it. And that's – humor is a great template for storytelling. <laughs> well, I got to tell you, I was – as I mentioned, I was on the flight raising – I was finishing up your book on the flight back from uh, North Carolina and I, I blurted out. I mean, I laughed out loud and it, the dude sitting next to me looks over like, I wonder what he's reading. And he <laughs> sees the cover – and I look at him, and he kind of scrunches up his nose like, forget the Alamo? That doesn't sound so funny. What could this guy be laughing about? And then he went back to doing his own thing. And I thought, God, that was pretty kind of an interesting interaction right there. Yeah. Um, forget the Alamo. And uh, do, do I keep saying remember the Alamo? Is this so ingrained in my head that I keep saying remember the Alamo? About Honest to God, I've said it on stage a few times. It's, yeah, it's embarrassing. Jesus. Forget the freaking Alamo already. And finally, okay, number three, find the right altitude. Yeah, this is the hardest thing for a lot of books that I mean, one, Brian taught me this in the course of writing this book is you can get real low and go through every detail and tell the story in a minute way, or you can be real high and just kind of summarize what happened. You can do both of those things well, right? And in an entertaining way, but to get people to read an entire book, you got to find the right altitude where you have enough specificity, but you keep the story moving along. Right, it's got to it's it's got to move. It's because you have to lead the reader. Right, the reader you the reader can't do the work. That's what we are for, and the editors we do all that work so the reader doesn't have to. And you find the right altitude, and the book just sails. How do you know when you find that altitude? Uh, when your editor tells you. I mean, because you know, I think <laughs> it's it's a uh, one for me. It's a function of feeling good while I'm writing it. You know, you it's it's sailing. You, the story's coming out faster than you can type it. And it's, it's feedback from readers and, and editors that we took out a third of the first draft because we did, we had not found the right altitude in the first draft. 
I went into zoning details. I apologize in, in the back half of the book. <laughs> zoning details. I'm glad you took those out, too. I would have zoned out right there. <laughs> but you guys cover so much ground and so many people. How you kept it all together through this book, which is a very lively read, uh, blew me away. I mean, that's a, that's a lot of effort. I'm glad it's successful. I'm really glad you enjoyed it. It pains me what we left out because there are some really good stories. There's a really good story with a shovel and a shotgun and a graveyard that I would have loved to put in the book, that I, uh, but I was never able to. All right. Well, Jason, I want to thank you so much for being here. This has been an absolute delight. And by the way, Randy also mentioned that you happened to pop in on one of our sessions. Was it with the World Bank where I did my business presentation around the ABT and how we use it in business? Yes. Were you there on that one? Yeah, that was terrific. Yeah. People should hire you is what I'm trying to say. Well, thank you. I was surprised to know you were there. I didn't know that. Yeah, it was wonderful. It was wonderful. Oh, well, thanks, but I uh, really appreciate it. And folks, man, you got to check it out. Forget the Alamo, the rise and fall of an American myth. And if I guess there's a through line on this show, it is what we remember. Our stories are what we remember, but we can remember them in lots of different ways. And if you are the storyteller out there and you're in charge of making sure that you anchor that story home, Jason's giving you some good ideas about how to do that. And by God, be truthful. Be authentic. <laughs> you know, don't tell a bunch of lies because you're going to end up having a Jason on your doorstep and they're going to they're gonna share what the real story is. Thanks, man. <laughs> Thank you. It was great. <laughs> I appreciate you all listening to this. Look, at if you got a dad that you want, you know, big time historian, by golly, get him this book. If you're a Texan, get this book. It is absolutely fascinating. If you're just simply in the business world, go get Forget the Alamo because it'll make you think twice about how you are sharing your story and you know how you can have the impact in the world you see. Check it out. And if I can help you, come on over to the Business of Story. If you have not yet taken your ABT training, you can access it right there at businessofstory.com forward slash ABT. Take the ABTs of Agile Communications and I guarantee you your messages will land right the first time every time because you're using this story structure of agreement, contradiction, and consequence. And if you happen to be a politician out there, get the narrative gym for politics. It is an absolutely fascinating read. And you know something too, Jason, I'll mention I told Randy this. We've got this whole series of books, right? He started with the narrative gym, which was just for the science world. And I said, we need a version for the business world. So we've got narrative gym for business. We've got narrative gym for law, written by Doug Passan. Uh, Passan. And now uh, we've got the narrative gym for politics and narrative gym for science. It's for graduate students and postdocs. And I have found that large companies, you know, when you were talking about the CEO or the leadership within companies finding their voice, that each one of these books has is very powerful. So the narrative gem for business, for sales and marketing and leadership, but that narrative gem for law is fantastic, you know, for your legal team and whatever to understand how you communicate um, your big ideas so that people, judges and juries and those those audiences that are pushing back can really connect with you. In the HR world, the narrative gem for politics is fantastic because, you know, in DEY, you're, you're always talking about this. Or DEI and you know, diversity, equity, inclusion, you're always thinking about the political nature of that culture that you're building here. Fantastic book. And then, of course, for all those egghead engineers in research and development, get the narrative gem for graduate students and postdocs because the way they approach it in the science world to be able to communicate those big, complex ideas simply through the ABT it's, you can absolutely apply it in the business world. So then Randy now has a whole library of books that we can all touch on. So anyways, check them out and come on back next Monday when we'll have another amazing story artist right here for you like Jason. And until then, remember that the most potent story you'll ever tell is the story you tell yourself. So make sure that's a great one. Thanks so much for listening.